Come on. There we go. Wow, that's loud. Um, uh, the timer is something new we're trying. Um, our hope is that, you know, as we collect and gather, uh, it's great that we can gather and have conversations and we're connecting and fellowshipping. But I'd also like to continue to help us focus and prepare our hearts and minds in the morning. So the timer is just a simple thing to say we're getting close. And if you're that type of person that likes to pray prior to the service or just meditate or get some quiet space, that's your moment for you. And for the rest of us that might like to talk and chat, which is okay, that might be also our signal that we can just kind of tone it down a little bit and begin to move towards uh, the start of the service. So, uh, you know, we're hoping it's just a tool that's going to help prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Uh, but welcome this morning. And uh, before Chris gets to the announcements, um, I have a, a couple uh, strategical things I'm going to mention in relation to worship this morning. One is our prayer time that Joe leads. Um, because of what's been happening down south and the storms this week and some other things, we're going to slightly shift how we do that. We're going to have a time of prayer, uh, but Joe and I are going to kind of lead us through that a little bit differently day, just so that we can have our hearts focused on those people in the south uh, this morning. Also, I wanted to mention in the back, some of you, most of you probably got an email from me this past week. We have a new newsletter. It's st still working on this, um, but this is the latest version. So if you don't have email or if you want a paper copy in the back, there's some yellow newsletters. Um, just some information that I'm trying to share with everybody on, uh, over the days and weeks ahead. So uh, there's some good information in there. Some of that information will point to an, a very important event that will happen on October 1st, which I assume maybe Chris will touch on. Um, but I just wanted to point that out. If you have some prayers today that you want to share, we're probably honestly not going to have that time to do it publicly. Um, please fill out one of these cards or uh, go to the prayer chain, our church prayer chain, and you can put those prayer requests out. We will all get those, those of us on the prayer chain, and we will lift those things up. So we will still lift up those personal prayers. But I thought it was important today to do a slight shift. Um, so we're going to do that today. So uh, with that, I'll have Chris come up, and uh, he'll cover a few announcements. Good morning. First and foremost, next Sunday is communion. So our Book of Government does require us to make that announcement a, a week in advance because it is important for us to prepare to get our hearts right with God and with each other. So use that time to remember. We do have a community kitchen on Friday. If you haven't volunteered uh, for that and would like to, please see Noel in the back. Please. Uh, Joe, do we have a, an update from the food bank yet? Okay. So <clears throat> for right now, we're still collecting baked beans, not pork and beans, baked beans. There's a difference. Not exactly sure what it is, but there is a difference. Apparently, the uh, amount of pork that's in it. We have on Tuesday, October 1st, if you have given your email to Adam, you will receive an email. It'll say it's coming from the church for, for, for Right Now Media. So we went through it last Sunday as part of the Sunday school time of clicking on the link, uh, that is in the email. It's not a spam email. So it is okay to click on the link in the email. For those of you that have been through any kind of cybersecurity training, they tell you never, ever, ever click on a link in an email. Uh, but this one is okay. Uh, we've added it out. So uh, click on the link. It'll ask you uh, to enter in a, a password, create an account, and then you'll have full access to the media library. If you do have any questions uh, or uh, problems, uh, just let me or Adam know, and we'll do what we can to, to help get you in. Um, Adam and I did uh, go to Presbytery this weekend. 
It was a good time, uh, not only doing the business of the greater church, the presbytery, uh, but also meeting with and just catching up with uh, friends and colleagues and um, pastors and elders that at least I've known for, for years now. Um, it was a good worship service. Um, Stu, you'll like this. Um, the grape juice that was at communion was pressed from grapes grown on their own property. So it wasn't wine yet, but uh, it was still pretty good. And the bread that they had was uh, gluten, but it was from the same recipe that they had been using for more than 100 years. So the woman that was making the bread in the church, he said was about 70 years old, and her great-grandmother was baking the same recipe bread uh, for the church. So that church was uh, celebrating their 250th anniversary. It, that's pretty good for the US, you know? Um, God is good. God is faithful. When he's planted people somewhere and he's got work for them to do, he makes sure that the work gets done and that the people are there. So it's a testament to God's faithfulness to them and an encouragement to us that we're here for a purpose and God won't let us fail. Amen? So let's now quiet our hearts and minds and put our focus on Jesus, the reason we're here.
I didn't have a chance to do it this week, but I'd like to get us doing some responsive readings for the call to worship. Um, things just got a little busy this week for me to, to get that in. So I do have another psalm for you for the call to worship. This is Psalm 135. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praise to his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel as his own possession. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain and brings forth the wind from its storehouses. He it was who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, both man and beast, who in your midst, O Egypt, sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh and his servants, who struck down many nations and killed mighty kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan, and gave their land as heritage, a heritage to his people Israel. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak. They have eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. O house of Israel, bless the Lord. O house of Aaron, bless the Lord. O house of Levi, bless the Lord. You who fear the Lord, Bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord from Zion, he who dwells in Jerusalem. The word of the Lord. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending ring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, 
lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Blessed are those who run to Him, who place their hope and confidence in Jesus. He won't forsake them. Blessed are those who see His face, who bend their knee and fix their gaze on Jesus. They won't be shaken. Come on and praise Set on pilgrimage with Jesus, they'll see His glory. Blessed are those who die to live, His joy it is to give it all for Jesus and for Him only. Oh Jesus, all for Your glory. Sanctuary, bless God in the fields of plenty, bless God in the darkest valley. Every chance I get, I bless your name. Bless God when my hands are empty, bless God when the praise that costs me, bless God when nobody's watching. Every chance I get, I bless your name. Bless God when the weapons fall me. Bless God when the walls are falling. Bless God cause he goes before me. Every chance I get, I bless your name. Bless God for he holds the victory. Bless God for he's always with me. Bless God for he's always worthy. Every chance I get, I bless your name. Every chance I get, I bless your name. Every chance I get, come on and praise the Lord with me. Sing if you love His name. Come on and lift your voice with me. He's worthy of all. You've known His grace. 
Come on and lift up your holy hands. He's worthy of all our praise. He's worthy of all our praise. So this morning, um, you know, I got thinking about prayer and one of the, the wonderful opportunities we have as a part of worship about expressing ourselves before our God, uh, sometimes is just to go before him and pray in our own ways and pray together as community. So we're, we're going to try something this week. Joe's going to open um, and with some um, thoughts and maybe some requests on what's been happening with the weather and the people down south. And then he's going to give you a time to pray on your own, in your own ways. And then he's going to close up that section, uh, if that's okay. Yep. And then um, I'm going to follow up with another section. So in a way, we're going to responsively work through some prayer uh, together in just a slightly different way this morning. So again, we are a praying church, and there's many, many ways to pray. As uh, uh, Pastor Adam has mentioned today, um, so we know that there are joys in our, our lives. We know that there are joys in our community, uh, whether that's family and friends, this church here today, uh, the work that we have, uh, the finances that allow us to, uh, to live. Uh, and we are thankful to God for these things and many other things, things like the first responders and the, the teachers that we pray for each week. Um, and we also look towards God for uh, blessings and help in uh, other areas, uh, especially those that are ill. We know that there are those in our community and in our church family specifically that need our prayers, as well as many things in our mind that we hold dear uh, or have as unspoken. So let us here take a moment as a group, quietly in silence, and bring to the Lord some of these things that are on our minds. And as Pastor uh, Adam mentioned, uh, I'll also uh, close us out after a few moments because we do know there's many things in the world that are much bigger than us individually that only God can really work in. So take a moment, please, and raise your prayers to the Lord. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we know that you hear all our prayers, those that are spoken out loud individually, those that are spoken as a group, those that are in our hearts or spoken silently as we have been praying to you this morning. We know, Lord, that we pray to you uh, each week, but also during the week for those on our hearts, like the first responders, those in the military and the police and the fire Lord, we pray for the teachers that are starting their school year and have been getting settled in. Uh, we know, Lord, that, that we pray to you for strength and for healing for those that are ill, especially those for, uh, that are near and dear to our hearts, as Kathy Hansen is. And we know that there are others uh, struggling through some things, Sue Sterling specifically we've heard, and the prayer chain, uh, uh, Marlon and Mary's son, and many others that are on our heart. Lord, we, we ask that you help with healing in those situations, with comfort for the family around them, support that, uh, they, that they need. Uh, but it's also been such a hard week, Lord, uh, not just in our church family, but throughout the, the country and throughout our world. We know the, the conflicts and the wars that are going on in Ukraine and in Sudan, and, and especially, Lord, as it widens now in the area of Israel, Lord, that uh, we ask that uh, you are uh, with all those that are suffering through these wars and conflicts, 
And we ask, Lord, that you start to bring peace in these areas to resolve these things uh, and so that these places can rebuild and um, uh, be safe and be uh, in, in peace. And Lord, here closer to home, what a storm that has come through from Florida up through Georgia and South Carolina and North Carolina. Lord, many, many people have uh, both lost their lives as well as uh, been impacted with much, much damage to their homes uh, or their neighbors. We ask, Lord, that um, and we ask for an outpouring of strength in those areas. We know people who are in that south in that area. We think of Maddie uh, Burley specifically from our own congregation in Atlanta. We, uh, we and our family know of uh, friends and uh, others that are down there, family members that may have been impacted directly or just uh, worried about those that they know in the area. And we ask, Lord, that you provide strength and um, uh, <coughs> that you provide care for those that are uh, that need to recover. Uh, we ask that you provide resources in many ways to help in rebuilding, and especially bring your peace and your presence to those who are uh, in this affected by this storm. We know, God, that you are a God that is with us and with all people that are looking towards you. Uh, we, we take comfort in that, and we ask that you give comfort to those affected by this storm in the same way. So, Lord, as we close this time, uh, we do like to say the prayer that your, uh, your Son has taught us, that you have taught us uh, as a group, uh, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we know that our prayer time does not end. Please, Adam, come, come forward because you have more to... Thank you. Uh, yeah, as Chris mentioned, um, Chris and I had the blessing of being at our Presbytery meeting in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, a beautiful facility. Uh, what a, a great group of churches uh, to be in partnership with, our sister churches within the EPC. And it, we had uh, quite a bit of an opportunity to kind of hear the news of what's happening uh, within our Presbyterian denomination. And I thought today as we pray that I'd highlight a few of those things but that we also, as a local body, can be praying for our presbytery uh, and our denomination as they continue to move forward with some exciting things. So, you know, we heard stories from the, uh, our mission, uh, our ministry development team, and, um, you know, things are going well in the Northeast. We, we see opportunity for some church plants. Some are in progress. Some are on the horizon. Uh, I believe the, the possibly the one closest to us, sort of, uh, is uh, Vermont. Uh, it, they're moving forward with the church plant in Vermont. Um, but within the Northeast, the churches, uh, you know, it was a blessing to hear the stories of the health and the wellness and the celebrations and the thing they're doing, the things they're doing in their very own communities, in their way, in their context, uh, to be the light of Christ, uh, to minister to the community, to go and make disciples, as we're all called to do. Uh, we heard from uh, our, our missions group and what a beautiful story to know that um, sometimes, you know, here, here we are in big flats every week and we collect locally, but to know even in this moment and in this time, uh, the EPC has missionaries around the world involved in various forms of missionaries. Some of the missionaries we heard from are preparing to go into the field. Uh, some we heard from have been in the field. Uh, and it's been, it was exciting to see where God's been shifting and moving them. And thank, thankfully through the, your generosity here, we support many of those initiatives. We support missionaries through the denomination. Uh, we support missionaries through the presbytery and that process. Um, and, and some of the missionaries also are supported by designated giving, which means we choose to support them out of that typical funding stream. But it, it was just a, a, a nice time of maybe celebration and reassurance just to know what, what's happening out in the world uh, 
across the world through the work that the EPC is doing, uh, our denomination. So it was a nice time. And uh, uh, pastors of uh, all church sizes and types and geographic location, we, they were from all over the Northeast. But just to hear the stories of what's happening. Um, and then undoubtedly, we didn't hear much news yesterday, but um, it's likely that even some of our sister churches in the South are involved in the response uh, to the weather-related uh, uh, event down south. And um, so I would like just to spend a moment, um, I'd ask you that we're, we're going to go before God and just in your own way, lift up these church plants that are trying to be faithful to the call to be present in a certain community in a certain time and place to share the gospel, uh, that God would bless them with uh, the resources they need, the success. Pray for the Presbytery. Is The Presbytery continues to grow uh, now in Vermont, our geographic region expands a little bit, um, and uh, that we would all be able to continue to collaborate and work together um, in spite of distance and geography, uh, that God would point us to ways to work collaboratively, and also just pray for missions in the world. And you may know missionaries, you may support missionaries that aren't part of the EPC, and that's wonderful. Um, be praying for them in your own ways, too, because we know there are other people out there trying to share the gospel. So we're going to spend a moment in prayer, and then I'll close up in that moment. So let's go before God. Lord, we just lift these things before you and ask and pray that you uh, shine your providence, your grace, your mercy over um, all these things we've discussed this morning. To the churches that are planting, to the pastors uh, new to their role, new to the pastorate, uh, new to the locations that they're moving into, Lord, that you give them wisdom, strength, durability, and presence. To the congregations, Lord, we give thanks that you call each one of us into ministry in our own unique ways to use our gifts, our resources, our times, our talents, our passions. And, and in this time, Lord, response is needed across the world. Within the U.S., within this community, you call us to go and make disciples. It's an action that requires not only our heart, not only our presence, not only our obedience, but investment of ourselves. So, Lord, show us how to do that. And I pray especially for uh, the communities down south, Lord, that, have, that in the last few days have found themselves without roads, without infrastructure, without heat, without electricity, without food, without support. Um, the communities as they know, grown up in and valued, some of them are just simply gone. And, Lord, we give thanks that uh, in your way and in your grace, you will call people to that area to respond. Uh, in their time and talents and gifts and resources. So in this morning, the least we can do is lift it, them up before you, Lord. Put them in front of you at the forefront of our hearts and minds, Lord. And I also pray, Lord, that if you're stirring in us ways to respond, ways we can each uniquely in our own way help those in need in this time, that you stir us to that. And Lord, I hope we have ears to listen this morning, that we will respond simply out of obedience and say, yes, Lord, here I am. Yes, Lord, I hear you, and I will respond. And also this morning, uh, I, I know uh, watching some of the news, there are just simply churches that physically don't exist, but the body's still there, Lord. And I pray this morning that you collect and gather and reassure and cover those people with your grace and mercy, Lord. Uh, help remind them about who they are and the blessings they have in you, and that you may use them mightily in this time to be your vessel during this time of uh, what looks like long recovery, and uh, just help them be who they need to be in this moment. And we just give thanks for the opportunity to be before you this morning, Lord, to lift up our hearts and to pray before you. And we give thanks in your name. Amen. And um, this morning, it, again, is a time for us to offer to God simply what he's already provided to us. Uh, we've been called to be stewards of the very thing God gives us to bring him our first fruits, 
uh, to bring us blessing uh, so that he can use it for his blessing, his honor, and in his ways. So what a remarkable opportunity we have. So as Noel comes forward, I'm just going to offer a, a simple prayer of thanksgiving for the opportunity we have to be first givers of what God's already provided us. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we just come before you giving thanks, knowing that you will use all that we give, whether we see it as minute and limited or too mighty and generous. Lord, let it be of our hearts. Honor what we give. Use it to your glory, to your kingdom. And we just give thanks for the opportunity we have to be called you, to be called yours, and to simply give back to you in appreciation and gratitude for all you've done for us. And we lift this up in your name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings fall. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. Be 
Heavenly Father, we ask that the Holy Spirit would open our hearts and our minds, that as we hear your word proclaimed, that we would not only hear, but understand, and in the understanding be changed. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We have a, a couple different small scripture readings this morning, so I think there's three, maybe four. Uh, first one is from Jeremiah. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Our next scripture reading is from Deuteronomy. On the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses, the one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. The hand of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people, so that you shall purge the evil from your midst. And then from Hebrews. For the word of, the, of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The word of the Lord. No, oh, one more. I thought there was more. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The word of the Lord. Those passages Chris just read, I, I'm, I'm still contemplating sometimes. I wish I could write those down for you to take them with you. But um, as a reminder, it's uh, Hebrews 4, 12 to 13. If you get time, process that passage at home this week after you've heard what you've heard. But Hebrews 4, uh, 12 to 13. And then John 3, 16 to 17. Process those a little bit. There's power in both those passages. So as I speak this week, um, you know, a, a story, it's kind of a, a somewhat of a personal story, and I'm sure as I get into the story, Tracy will attest that the story is probably true because it tends to look at me. But have you ever had those moments when you're working with somebody or you're discussing something with somebody and you are convinced you are right? all the time, and your, your inside is, you, you say something, but your inside, your mind, now begins to build the proof to what you just said. And in a way, you're saying, I'm right. So you begin a conversation, and of course, the other person might have a difference of opinion. And you begin to think, to yourself, no, wait a minute, I know I'm right. So you begin to give more feedback, more debate, more discussion, maybe emotions rise up. And then, you know, you get to the point to say, well, I'm not even sure I'm listening to you anymore because I know I am right. And I think what happens is sometimes in our, as we prepare our defense for what we think we claim to be right and true, um, confusion sets in. Maybe we actually forget what we were talking about. Uh, we become perplexed. Like all of a sudden now you've got, you've got to make yourself right. And the other person, you're perplexed by the other person. And in a way, maybe even inside, in, in your soul, you're recognizing like, oops, I'm wrong. 
Uh, I'm a little embarrassed, but I'm going to keep this going. I, I, you know, I'm going to keep pushing the issue and the point. And, and in a way, you get to a point of exasperation. Now, this can go either way. The, the argument, the debate can continue to cycle. Both sides, emotions can rise. And now you're trying to prove each other wrong. And the argument goes south, sideways, out in left field, whatever you want to call it. And eventually, you're, you're making points to the case that have no bearing on what you're even talking about. And then some, I think really, it's, it's innate in our nature sometimes. We don't want to be wrong. And then at times, there's possibility. We get to that point where we're so exasperated, we walk away. Which probably is a good thing, because now we're going to set our emotion sides. But maybe that person says something else. And you're like, oops, whoop, can't let that go. And you swing back into the conversation. And, um, you know, I, I'm so thankful that when we get in those moments, hopefully none of you get in those moments. Um, but when I get in those moments, uh, you know, I'm, I'm able to take a breath and stand back and work with people. And people work with me gracefully. But I just got thinking about that scenario. You know, how far will we go to prove that we are right? Last week, we were looking at a, di a discourse, a teaching of Jesus, and it was his time was split between Capernaum and Jerusalem. And it moves into chapter 7. And for those of you that maybe are diehard chapter 7 people, we're going to kind of skip over it. Um, we're going to highlight it, but we're going to go into chapter 8. So if you have a Bible with you, we're going to be in John chapter 8, and uh, we are not going to go verse by verse. There's a point I'm trying to get to in this chapter. But since chapter 6, and now chapter 7 to 8, about six months have passed. So time has passed since Jesus fed the thousands. And he met his disciples on those raging, storming waters and brought them safely to shore. Time has passed. We talked that his public ministry is increasing, meaning more and more people are seeing him and paying attention to him, saying, who is this person? Who is this man? And as a result of that, the religious leaders' turmoil is beginning to surface. They're becoming frustrated with this Jesus, this person that seems to teach what they think is contrary to what they believe and teach. They're becoming exasperated, frustrated that this person is still out there teaching and performing these signs, but yet as they eyes see, he seems to be different than they are. And in a way, as we move into chapter 8, the religious leaders are kind of getting to that point saying, we've had enough of this man. The time has come. So what happens is we open with chapter, or chapter 7, uh, I'll share just some points. There's discussions that happen in chapter 7 regarding how men saw Jesus, how religious leaders saw Jesus. And some, these are some of the things they claimed he is. So I'm going to go through these. But in verse 12, they said, oh, this, this man, he must be a good man. Verse 15, they say, this man before us, he seems educated. He's an educated man. Verse 20, they get to the point to say that he's got a demon. There's something not right. Verse 22, they go back to his, they say, son of God, he's just a simple man of Galilee. In verse 40, some of them acknowledge to say, oh, his teaching is great. He must be a prophet. Verse 41, someone actually raises the question and says, could he be this Christ we hear of? Could he be? So God opened the door. It opened the hearts of some of the people listening and experiencing Jesus. But then finally in verse 42, as the chapter closed out, they said, wait a minute. We have all these ideas of who Jesus is, but he is not from the royal line of David, he is from Jerusalem. No one from Jerusalem comes from the royal line of David. So they're creating opposition in their minds and in their hearts to who this man is. Jesus continues to be faithful and true to who he is. He continues to teach and be who he is, yet they continue to say, oh, if not this, then he must be this. If he's not this, he must be this. Their minds and hearts have still not gone to accepting him as the person he claims to be. 
So we walk into chapter eight. This is another discourse. Uh, this is the sixth discourse in the gospel of John. And in a way, I call it the shady trap. A shady trap is set. So I'm going to read through some verses. Verses, uh, chapter eight, verse one and two say this. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him. He sat down and taught to them. Two significant things happen here. He went to the Mount of Olives. This is a very clear pattern that Jesus has set. He's been with the people. He's been in ministry. He's been out in the community teaching and doing signs. But now he retreats to the calm, the peace, of his own time with his father. And he goes to the Mount of Olives. It was likely through the night, so he spent the evening there by himself. There's no indication that others were with him. He rises in the morning, and where does he go? Remember, opposition is growing to him. It is no longer safe for him, as we think, to be out in the world. The very first place he goes is to the temple where these religious leaders that are exasperated with him can confront him again. So he arrives at the temple. It's in his nature. It's his pattern. It's who he is. He spent time with the Father, and now he goes to the temple. And in this time that's being talked about, um, this was a, a, a season of festival, sometimes called the Festival of Booths, where they would gather in Jerusalem and go to the temple for teaching. So not only were the religious leaders there, others came and others that were not normally part of Jerusalem came in to Jerusalem to be at the temple to be taught by the religious leaders. And here now Jesus stands before them. The timing in our seasons, the way we think of our calendar, it was probably September, October. So the time of year this took place is somewhat close to the time we're in right now seasonally. For the Jews, for the religious leaders, this was a time of joy, celebration, thanksgiving. They were celebrating, they were remembering, and yet Jesus is beginning to get to teach again and begin to exasperate them even more. But in this trap they set up, Jesus, they know he's now at the temple. He's teaching. Ah, we have an idea. And in verse 3 through 6, it says this. The scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placed her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? They said this to test him, that they may have some charge bring against them. We have to talk about this scenario, because they have gotten to the point that they know that they are so right Jesus is so wrong, they've set this trap. And in a way, they've condemned themselves in the way they set this trap. See, they brought a woman. They claimed she was caught in adultery. The problem with this it was within the law of the time, both parties, the man and the woman, should have been brought up for trial. They don't take her to trial. They don't bother with the man. They grab the woman and bring her before Jesus in the temple to be a public spectacle. Okay, Jesus, we've got you now. This woman has been caught in adultery. So the point of this whole thing isn't about the adultery. It's the point of what they are trying to do to Jesus in this moment. And they basically say in the law, you must stone her. That's what they say. And verse 6 says they're testing him. You see, in a way, in their emotional angst. They've rushed to a process that doesn't even align with the law that they follow. They've circumvented, stepped out of the very law that they claim to adhere to, protect and honor and observe. And they tarnished it out of their emotion, out of their hatred, out of their exasperation for Jesus to set this trap. And we also know that the way this is worded is really unique. This woman has been caught in the act of adultery. One of the things Chris mentions is that witnesses had to be two or three or more. To catch her in the act of adultery meant that they were watching her. 
So they had literally planted a spy amidst her home, community, to watch her. And that spy had caught her in adultery. That in of itself also was a problem with what they believed and adhered to. So in a way, they're bringing her before Jesus, this public spectacle. People are gathered thinking, we've got him now. We've set the trap. The bait is set. We've got him. See, Jesus faced a crisis in that moment. And I say crisis, not, maybe not. He knew how he was going to deal with it. But we can think of it as a crisis. In that moment, he faced a choice. Just as sometimes when we're in these moments of debate and argument over truth and untruth, we're at a moment of decision. You see, he could have let her go. That would have broken the law. Because a trial should have taken place. So if he was to follow the law, the next natural step would be say, gather the witnesses, gather the evidence. Let's do this the way we should. Also, they asked her to, to stone her. To execute her because of the lack of witnesses and because the man wasn't present as a part of the charges would have been extreme and out of proportion to the claim. So it looks like he had two choices, let her go or to execute her. He doesn't make the choice. We go to six, uh, we finish chapter or uh, verse six and go to verse nine. And this is what these verses say. Let's see how it's up to six to seven, six and seven say Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And they continued to ask him as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let who let he, sorry, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Verse 8 and 9 say, and once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. I've had discussions over the years, you know, wouldn't we love to see what Jesus wrote? And there's continuing scholarly debate about what he wrote. But the point may not be so much as what he wrote, but why he wrote. You see, this created in the tension of that moment a very, very, very uncomfortable pause. The religious leaders were waiting for one of two answers, either which would in a way condemn Jesus of violating the religious law. Jesus doesn't even answer them. He doesn't give them choice one or choice two. He makes this statement. He, he kneels, stoops down and marks on the ground, just as Deuteronomy mentioned. Jesus doesn't respond with anger or sharp words or rebuke. He pauses, kneels, and writes on the ground. It's possible that that act of writing could have symbolically represented a record keeping of the accusers, meaning those who stood circled around expecting Jesus to make a mistake so that they could condemn him. There's some that say that he may have been scribbling out their records, their sins. We don't know. But I see the power in this moment is that pause. Jesus diffuses the emotion of the moment, the tension of the moment, and something very unique happens. You see, this passage says he doesn't speak to them. He doesn't rebuke them. He simply pauses. And I think what we're seeing here is they, one by one by one, step away, drop their rocks, and wander away with their backs to Jesus. God has worked on their hearts to convict them of the very sinful nature they have. And in a way, they recognize the power in what Jesus is saying is, I am not that person. I am not that sinless person who can stand here and accuse that woman and even do so wrongly. So what I think in a way is, is time passed, is Jesus paused, their consciences spoke to them. And we know that's the power of the work of God, the mystery of God, even on the hearts of unbelievers, that he can speak into the hearts of the unbelievers, soften their hearts, convict their hearts, draw them to Jesus. And in a way, I think here what we see is a picture of God softening their hearts 
removing some of the hardness and the tension of the moment. But in verse 10 and 11, this happens. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. And from now on, go and sin no more. He doesn't condemn her. Yes, she may have been caught up in adultery. Yes, the proper processes or channels may not have been followed. But Jesus doesn't speak into her sharply and rebuke her for that very fact. He says, you know, we see this with some of the healing. Stand up and go. He basically says to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. This is the power of a personal encounter with Jesus. And for those of you who accepted, have accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior, this is the power for us that we see in the power of this simple verse. Go and from now on sin no more. That is what we are called to do. God embraced this out of grace and out of mercy in the moment. We may think we're in the wrong. We might have been fighting our whole time to say, God, I know what I'm thinking. God, I have got this. God, I know what I believe. We may continue at times to push back. But in this moment, we're just in his grace, in his presence, in his mercy. And Jesus just simply says, you know me, go and sin no more. And that's the power and beauty of the message of the gospel that we carry today to people around us. We don't hold them obedient. They become obedient out of the change of their heart. They become obedient out of their own response and condition to God for who he is. Our focus is on showing them the grace and mercy of God. And the point, the highlight of this passage, um, which I may not speak as much on today, but if you ever get some time to do some study at home, verse 12, and it says, Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He teaches to the example he just set. That woman now walks in the light of Christ, in the light of life. And that's the beauty for each believer here in this church, in this community, in the world. He's called each one of us to walk in that light. We walk outside of judgment. The judgment, the final judgment is over and done with. It took place on the cross. And by our accepting Christ, we now walk in this life and Jesus calls us to obedience. He says, go and sin no more. So we know we have an obedient life ahead of us that we need to strive for and work to. But we know even in those moments when we goof up, when we make a mistake, when things don't look like they're working our way, God surrounds us with our grace and presence. He still remains our light. He still remains our Lord and Savior. He still remains our King of our life. But something happens now with the people that are hearing this. Remember, he's, he's at the temple. Those that picked up the rocks to cast the first stone simply dropped them. Maybe they walked away. Maybe they kind of stepped back to the second row. Maybe the third row. Maybe that I, I, I got to get back so Jesus doesn't see me. I got to feel better about this. But they filter away. And now Jesus has this conversation with the, women, and the woman. And the rest of this passage is pretty neat. Because those who have been exasperated by Jesus get even more exasperated. And the rest of this passage is the response. So in verse 13 and 14, and I might move through these some fast, because what I want you to pay attention to as I read some of these passages, their, their question and response and Jesus' response is the attitude. I want you to pay attention to their attitude in this point. They're at wit's end with Jesus. They have simply had enough. And this is what happens. So in verse 13, it says, So the Pharisee said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself, the thing you just talked to us about. So your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do not bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where, am I, where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. Ooh, sting. They attempt to now, like, oh, wait a minute, Jesus, the, the thing you just talked to us about, you're guilty of that too. But he's continuing to, remember, this book is focused on God, Jesus' deity. He is the son of God. 
So Jesus continues to teach on the fact that I am God. And they basically say, your claim's not valid. You can't witness about yourself. We're the two witnesses. We looked at it in Deuteronomy. We looked at it earlier in here. And I think in a way in the world, people do that with Jesus. They hear the truth of the gospel. They see the truth of the gospel. But something inside them says, I need more. I need more. Show me more. Show me, show me one more thing and I'll accept you for who you are. And then they get that. It's fed to them. And then they say, oh, wait, that was nice. I want one more thing. I want more witnesses and more witnesses. And there are people who walk through life. They've heard the gospel. They know the gospel. God's still working in their hearts, trying to soften those hearts and bring them to him. But there are people that walk life claiming, I know about Jesus. He's got to show me a little more. You see, what Jesus is saying, I am who I am. I have proclaimed myself. And then in verse 19, they say to him, another argument, where's your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Sharp words. They're basically saying, we, we know God. Where, where's this father you claim to have? In John chapter 1, verse 18, that text reminds us the truth that Jesus himself makes known. So they're not accepting of the very truth that stands before them, Jesus, Son of God. And I think in a way, in their own pride, in their own angst, their own anxiety, their emotions are rising. They continue to miss this point that God is, or Jesus is the messenger. Jesus is the Son of God. And in verse 22 to 24, this will be 22 to 23 we'll look at first. It says, so the Jews said, Will he kill himself? Since he says, where I am going, you, not, you cannot come. Pay attention to that verse. Where I'm going, you cannot come. That's a statement that Jesus made. Jesus said to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. They're wrestling again with who Jesus is. And in their prideful way, they saw, Jesus, they saw themselves as better than Jesus. And in fact, there's significance to that verse 23, where I am going, you cannot come from. The only place their mind could go, remember, this is a prideful people. The only place they could go in their pride was, we know where we're going, Jesus. We will go to be with God. If you're not with us, the only place you could be going is Hades. So they're arguing the point that we know where we're going. Um, and so their assumption, their mind going, this Jesus, he's, he's going to Hades. He's going to hell. And that's what's happening in the language of this section. So they're beginning to recognize that there's some significant difference that their minds can't overcome. So in verse 25, uh, he says, they say this. So they said to Jesus, who are you? Who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. They're saying, we, we, we don't get it. You make no sense. And Jesus just calmly stands before them and says, I, I am who I am. I am that very person I've been telling you about. So I almost think in a way that rage began to surface at this moment, that the decisions the religious leaders began to make lacked logic, sense. They were fuming. But Jesus intercedes. And in verse 28 to 30, we see this teaching of Jesus, and it's really powerful. Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will know that I am He. And that I do nothing out of my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed. So something happened here. God continues to speak, or Jesus continues to speak pointedly to those that are denying him, which I'm sure just continues to build their 
exasperation, their confoundment with Jesus. But in this moment, this teaching, when there's conflict and debate, it says many came to believe. And I think this is a picture of this was good, honest debate about truth, about the gospel, about God. And some people's minds and hearts were opened to who Jesus was. Many believed in him. Doesn't say all. It says many. We don't know how many is, but many is a good thing. It could have said one believed in him. That would still be a blessing and a success. But in the midst of this, in this big public spectacle where they've set this trap, the trap now backfires and many become to say, yes, Jesus, you are the one you claim. I will follow you. Many have come to believe. But to those whose hearts were hardened, some of those religious leaders and people, something happens. Jesus says in 31, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You see, they simply embraced Jesus for who he was, for his claims, the gospel message they fully accepted. And that simple act of truth, of hearing the truth and accepting in faith is all that it took for them to be saved. They didn't have to somehow live a new life and then become saved. They became saved, his redeemed in the moment. But to those who had hardened hearts and ears, there's a few passages that really shows where they're headed with their plot. Verse 33 says, they answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it you say you will become free? They argue another point. They throw something else against the wall to see if it'll stick. Jesus has a response. I'm not going to read these responses. You can look at these because some of them are detailed. But I want you to see the hearts of the people that are trying to set out against Jesus. Verse 39 says this. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Then they say in verse 41, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. And Jesus says in 43, why do you not understand what I say? It's because you cannot bear to hear my word. Imagine the power in that statement. Why do you not understand what I say? It's because you cannot bear to hear my word. Their ears were closed. They continued to throw claim after claim after claim after Jesus. And he just stood before them being who he was. And in fact, we get to verse 48, and this kind of closes out some of their arguments. But see how far they go in their arguments. Verse 48, to, that goes to 51. The Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? You're, you're crazy. You, there's something about you that's not right. You, you have a demon. Jesus says, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. See, Jesus cycles back to that idea of claims being brought against them. Their claim that you yourself cannot be your own witness. He's pointing to the fact that God, my Father, is my witness. I have been sent by him. In 51, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. And here the Jews respond. The Jews said to him, now we, now we know that you have a demon. Now, it's final. It's finished. You're done. We're done with you. We've had enough of you. We now know you have a demon. Abraham died just as the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. They don't understand the resurrection, remember. And they haven't seen the resurrection. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? That they're 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 just they they just don't see and understand. And I would venture to say that sometimes is the world around us. There are people, I would say I've met people, they are exasperated by Jesus. I think in a way they know the truth. They've heard the truth. In their hearts, there is a deep wrestling with who is this God? He doesn't 
he doesn't meet this expectation I have of him. He doesn't meet this expectation. He didn't come from this. He keeps saying he is God. And I've seen, I know that he's performed miracles and signs. And we know history says that Jesus existed. But in their heart, I think even today, people still wrestle with that. I know I, I, know I can be right. There's just something about this Jesus that doesn't make sense. And they wrestle, and they wrestle, and they wrestle. And I think that's somewhere we can just simply give thanks for the grace of God, knowing that God is working in their heart and in that situation. We probably will not win the argument for them. We probably cannot stand before them and say, let me talk to you about Jesus, and we're going to win the argument. God can win that argument in the fight in their heart to wrestle with who is this Jesus. Jesus brings people to a point of decision, and that's between them and God. But as we know people, as we walk alongside people that wrestle, we can be there alongside them to love them, to encourage them, to show them grace and mercy. We don't have to be the crowd that continues to, yeah, you're right, stick to your plan, stick to your plan. You know, you've got this. Just continue to push back against God and against Jesus. And there's people in this world that continue to push back. In fact, when they say, who do, you, who do you make yourself out to be? Let's look at what happens in verse 59. Remember where this all started. They once again picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. But they got to the point, this, they were wrestling with this so deep, deeply. They went back to the, we're going to pick up the stone and, and we're going to stone this man, this prophet, this man from Galilee, this man who claims to be a great teacher. We're going to stone this man who is not the son of God. And that is where they get to in this passage. So why did I share this text and this story as I close? I think there's a reality that exists for us. And, and I say this in a constructive way. So I don't mean to say this in a way that um, maybe creates conflict in you. But sometimes I think we too comfortably walk in the world thinking we are the true light of God. When this passage tells us Jesus is the light of the world. As we begin to walk more Christ-like, to be filled by the Spirit, to walk in our gifting, to walk in our calling, to be interacting in the world around us, the only way we can go and make disciples is to be out in the world. We have to be walking alongside people. This passage shows that there will be people in the world wrestling with who is this Jesus? Who is this God? And Jesus simply says, I stand before them, just as he stood before us. And just as we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, he still offers that to the people wrestling, to the people with stones, saying, no, Jesus, you're, you're not who you say you are. Jesus still stands before them, working in their hearts and their minds. So if we think about this idea coming out of uh, chapter 8, that Jesus is the light of the world, what does that really mean? And it means that it's a light that offers grace and forgiveness in life, not judgment. You see a lot of brokenness in the church, and I say church with a capital C, big C, all the churches. The brokenness, I think, sometimes is we expect people to conform to who we want them to be, our image our expectations, and then we say, oh, welcome, let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus throws that whole idea upside down to say, it matters not what you do, it matters who you are, and the who you are comes from your heart. Have you put your faith and trust in myself as Lord and Savior? All things come out of that. With the woman at the well, the feeding of the thousands, Jesus in the raging sea as the disciples reached out, Jesus, save us. 
as we see now with this teaching of the woman that was about to be basically illegally condemned. Jesus said, all those things will work out later. First, you must come to me and accept me as Lord and Savior. Then I call you to go and be a light to the world. Go and make disciples. Go and tell others. And I think sometimes we get things backwards and we, we become like the religious leaders. We focus on the external with people. It's our natural tendency. When we see someone, we react out of preconceptions, misconceptions. Do we really know what's going on in their heart? Do we really know what they're wrestling with? Because if we take time to find out what they're wrestling with, what they're dealing with, and we can walk alongside them in the grace and love that God showed here to this woman, she was about to be killed, stoned, because of the anger of the world. Yet Jesus saved her, and not only saved her, but called her to a different way of life. And I think there's a powerful example in this passage. You see, if we think about Jesus as the light of the world, The light of the world, Jesus, brought sin to light. We now know how deep sin can go because in Jesus, we see the purity of the light. We see here where Jesus is the witness of God the Father. Jesus is God. That's taught to us and shown to us over and over and over again. And you remember remember what happened later. Jesus took death to its knees. That as this book closes out, Jesus finished kind of the absurdity of the law that they're trying to adhere to. Nothing they could do could bring them to right reconciliation with God except for the work of Jesus and the power of the cross. So we're now called to be back as believers We're called back into relationship with Jesus. We can stand at the foot of Christ. We can be with God. The Spirit dwells in us. That is such a beautiful thing. There are people in the world around us that don't have that blessing and benefit. They walk in darkness. They might fully understand where they've gone wrong. They may fully understand what they're doing that's not honoring of God but they're wrestling. They're wrestling with that moment of, can I stand before Jesus and just simply take this offer of believe in me, have trust in me, have faith in me, and then I can simply go walk a new life. People struggle with that. But the beauty of us as relationships is we are back in full relationship with him. And the spirit works in each one of you, gifting you, moving you, Sometimes the Spirit's kind of called the wind in our sails. It's the thing that gives us strength and purpose and perseverance and durability. So think about the lame man who was healed at the pool, the woman at the well. Now this woman who was probably being prodded along by these religious leaders and she fully thought she was going to die. She has new life now. And that's the power and blessing of what Jesus gives to us. And there might be times even in our own hearts and minds we wrestle with God. We claim our own way, claim our own thing. I I think this passage simply shows the reality of the world. God calls us to make disciples of all the world, but we know from Scripture and from history, some will choose to believe, some will not. But the caution for us is let us not be the people to pick up the stones to condemn others before we've really considered their heart. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we hear your word this morning, we just continue to give thanks for the blessing of your son Jesus, for the teaching, for the truth that we have before us. And we know even if we go back in time to um, the time of this text, this writing, this witness, that we know in 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 their own ways, they didn't necessarily have the word as we think, but we know they knew the word. 
The word was preached. The word was taught. Jesus lived, stood, and taught before them. And yet, some struggled. We know in this day and age that some will struggle, but Lord, help us be faithful to you. Let us fully rest in the blessing of having new life. But let us not get too comfortable in having life. Give us strength and durability, perseverance, vision as we be, continue to walk out this new life that Jesus called us to, that we have work ahead of us, that in these days as the world hurts, as there's loss, as there's grief, as there's mourning, as people walk in the darkness of sin, we can be that light that shows the difference between who has faith and trust in Jesus and who doesn't. But the purpose is not to condemn. The purpose is to walk beside people, plant the seeds, assist the Spirit, assist God as each person is called to be the son and daughter of, Jesus, of God. We just give thanks that you've given us that ability, that capacity, that call. Let us be obedient to that. Let us be faithful to that. Uh, and let us just rest and celebrate who we are in you. That that very light we've seen, accepted, gives us life, gives us hope, and gives us purpose, even in these days. We just give thanks for the opportunities ahead. Amen.
appreciated, not only by myself, I'm sure by fellow church members and our church family, 
but God appreciates you. God calls you. God calls each one of us into his family, into his service, into his ministry. What a blessing we have to walk that together. This morning, I wanted to share uh, a benediction. It's out of the the Pilgrim Hymnal, which is a a very old book. It came out of a congregational church system. But there's beauty in these words as it's written. So this is what I share with you this morning. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and that of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.